Why are so many filmmakers obsessed with the anamorphic look? I mean, what is so special about it? When people say a shot looks anamorphic, they're usually not talking about the wide aspect ratio. And when they say anamorphic lenses are so cinematic, they're also usually referring to a cluster of optical traits that have appeared in hundreds, maybe thousands of films, from Ben Hur in 1959 to this year's summer blockbusters. We've seen these looks so often that our brains read them like words in a visual vocabulary. Cultural memory, really. It's time we get over the challenge of translating it into actual words, as we've been working so hard for. This episode decodes the cues of the anamorphic look, how certain optical traits became tied to emotion, genre, and storytelling. So you can use that knowledge in your own filmmaking. We're a module five of the anamorphic cookbook, thankfully sponsored by DZO. We're filming on Pavo anamorphics and leaning into the traits I'm about to explain. At this point, we all know that anamorphic lenses started as an engineering fix in the early 1950s, a way to squeeze a wider image onto 35mm film and fight back against television. The trade-off of putting cylindrical glass in front of good old lenses and cameras was new optical behavior. The wider aspect ratio was greatly desired, but it came with a bunch of bugs. It was an arms race to get the best anamorphic lens design out the door, while also making films using these deeply flawed designs. Filmmakers, lens makers, and studio execs fought imperfections at every turn. The robe, the first cinemascope feature, shows restraint in camera movement, avoids close-ups whenever possible, works hard to keep main characters towards center frame, and couldn't do anything about its glowy quality. In spite of those issues, its epic story combined with a massive screen size sold the novelty of bigger than life. Uneven distortion across the frame, soft images, and warped close-ups became part of the storytelling language. Not necessarily on purpose, but simply because they appeared in so many films that attracted millions of people to movie theaters at a revolutionary point in Hollywood history. Let's dig into this and name the image qualities that make up the anamorphic look, using the vocabulary from the previous module. Each of these traits has a physical cause, a history in cinema, and a learned meaning through repetition. Together, they form a shorthand audiences recognize subconsciously. Let's start with the only anamorphic trait that needs to be dead and buried. Many early anamorphic designs and projection anamorphics were made up of two cylindrical groups. The process of adjusting focus in these designs involved changing the distance between the two groups. Mumps came from the fact that the change in the air gap between them also caused a change in magnification. Remember, air gap was one of the five degrees of freedom lens designers used to correct aberrations. So while a lens displays the desired two times squeeze at infinity focus, when pushed into a close-up, that number could drop all the way down to 1.6, for example. When projecting the film, this change in squeeze is very visible, leading to distorted proportions. Thankfully, we seem to have mostly moved away from such designs, popularly known as double focus or synchro focus. You can learn more about them by checking out module two. One of the most recognizable traits in older anamorphic lenses is spherical aberration. It happens when light rays passing through the edges of the lens don't converge at exactly the same point as the ones going through the center. The result is a slightly softer image. 
the transition from sharp to blurred loses that crisp edge and bright highlights start to bloom. You can see it right away in Dr. Zhivago. The snow and sky feel almost like they're glowing from within. It's not the sharpness that we remember, it's the atmosphere. The same goes for The Egyptian, filmed a decade earlier, as fear collaboration gives the bright sunlight a mythic, larger-than-life quality. The way sphere collaboration shows up in the image became shorthand for romance, nostalgia, warmth, and memory. Not because sphere collaboration is sentimental, but because filmmakers kept using this look for sentimental films. Over time, we learned to read the softness as a feeling. Perspective looks unique and anamorphic because the lens's magnification is different along each axis. The horizontal squeeze gives you a wider angle of view, while the vertical axis stay true to the focal length. The best way I found to explain it is, you get telephoto compression with wide-angle coverage. A 40mm anamorphic close-up doesn't feel anything like similar framing in either 20mm or 40mm spherical especially once you crop to a widescreen format. That mix changes how space and motion read on screen. The bridge on the River Kwai used that breadth to make its jungle and bridge construction feel monumental, people completely dwarfed by their surroundings. In Ben-Hur, the same perspective turns side-to-side -side motion into pure spectacle, chariots tearing across the frame with impossible speed. It's not just the story that makes a film feel big, it's how the glass shapes the world inside the frame. Through the widescreen revolution in the mid-50s, we learned to associate this aspect ratio and perspective with the visual language of the epic, wide environments framing strong close-ups. Streak flares are one of the biggest giveaways that we're looking at anamorphic glass. Because of the cylindrical elements and older coatings, point sources of light stretch into streaks. During the 1960s, filmmakers were starting to embrace lens flares as a marker of realism, allowing stray light in the frame as proof that what you were seeing was really photographed. That became part of the aesthetic. Flares grounded the image. In Cool Hand Luke, Conrad Hall, using anamorphic lenses, makes the choice of embracing streak flares as a marker of authenticity. You can almost feel the heat and the dust from the picture. From that initial push, some filmmakers took flares and turned it into style. Close Encounters of the Third Kind and Blade Runner used flares to help disguise some of their special and visual effects, transforming real light into something spectacular, futuristic. As flares helped filmmakers tell fantastic stories, anamorphic flares became part of the visual language of cinema. A streak across the frame could mean authenticity, energy, wonder, or all three at once. Cinematographers often talk about the painterly quality of anamorphic bouquet, as if the out-of-focus areas are made of long brush strokes. This elongated quality, in combination with the spherical aberration that we talked about, delivers a unique rendering for the depth of a scene. In Superman, we frame the Man of Steel without losing texture in the world around him. The ovals in the background make Metropolis feel both larger than life and physically present. In Apocalypse Now, the lenses hold clarity on the focus faces, while the jungle behind them dissolved into textured blur. This rendering made the environment feel dense, alive, and mysterious, keeping us focused on the story, but always watching out for danger. The painterly look became tied to the big screen itself because, for decades, anamorphic films only existed in theaters. And although anamorphic lenses have been made much more accessible in the last 10 years, we are still far from overshadowing 60 years of anamorphic classics. So when we see Ovo Bokeh, we see cinema, and we yearn for the big screen. Starting at the mid-1970s and carrying all the way to the late 80s, we witnessed the transition from New Hollywood to the modern blockbuster era. 
films were often an extension of the edgier, more experimental cinema we've been seeing in the previous decade, but now focusing on creating repeatable commercial formulas and intellectual properties. The unprecedented success of Jaws and Star Wars push executive producers to approve higher and higher budgets, with larger marketing campaigns leading up to the film's release. Audiences lined up for repeated watching of the same films, our summer blockbusters, leading to record-breaking box offices. It was the beginning of how Hollywood operates nowadays. Around the same time, Panavision puts out their C-series anamorphics, and they are used in a lot of these big-budget, super-advertised films. To contribute on why, the C-series were smaller and faster than previous designs, which made them practical on set. As they were super popular, their look defined the visual language of the period. And through repeated box office successes, C-series became the pop culture look of cinema. That consistency meant audiences were being trained shot after shot to read that visual language as cinema itself. I mean, the C-series were used in Star Wars, Close Encounters of the Third Kind, Superman, Chinatown, Raiders of the Lost Ark, Halloween, Blade Runner, Ghostbusters, and so many more films that all of us have watched. Different in tone and story, but unified by a consistent visual language revolving around the same glass. I might be overreaching here, but when somebody says today that they want cinematic lenses, I think they're often describing the C-Series look, which I also believe is the foundation of the anamorphic look. So let's try to break it down, shall we? Most anamorphics until this point are quite bulky and quirky, displaying uneven squeeze and strong distortion, and required a decent amount of stopping down to clean up the image. The C-Series were small, offered a wide array of focal lengths and faster apertures between T2.3 and T2.8, with more controlled aberrations than its predecessors and competitors. The squeeze was uniform across the frame and over the focus range, eliminating all issues with mumps. We're also at a time before stopping down lenses was considered a crime, and cinematographers lean into the choice of filming at a lens's sweet spot, about two stops from wide open mitigating some of those aberrations that we were trying to pick up on. Their iris shape, plus undercorrected spherical aberration, and them being front anamorphic designs, creates smooth oval bokeh through the entire aperture range. In spite of stopping down, the astigmatism from imperfect cylinders and undercorrected spherical aberration lead to softer top and bottom of the frame. The spherical aberration also helps with the perceived depth of field, making the transition from sharp to blurred a bit less clear in what Dan Sasaki calls organic focus roll-off. We talked about this in the previous module. Their focus mechanism, designed to counter mumps, introduced a distinctive kind of disproportionate breathing, pulling much more on the vertical axis than horizontal. Last, in the 1970s, it was no longer a crime to have lens flares show up in the footage, giving us plenty of outstanding blue streaks. The look feels right. It's what our brains, or at least people of my generation and before, file under movie. The breathing, the softness, the flares became invisible shorthand for story and emotion. So when we talk about the anamorphic look, this is pretty much where it starts. The traits explored here are not simply historical curiosities. They're decision points from filmmakers like us. Understanding which optical behaviors signal warmth, scale, intimacy, or spectacle helps us choose the lenses for our next projects. In the next episode, I will break down more specifically how lens choice and character traits interact with storytelling genres by trying to match narrative styles to different styles of anamorphic glass, based on which aspects of the anamorphic look they deliver and which ones they compromise. Remember that as audiences, we don't think about aberrations. We have feelings about stories that look a certain way. Every time you choose a lens, you're tapping into that shared memory. A century of cinema has taught us what uneven magnification, oval bouquet, or astigmatism mean 
from a storytelling perspective. Understanding those roots lets you build your own visual language, one that benefits from decades of history and meaning instead of imitation. Thank you for watching, and I'd love to hear your key takeaway from this episode in the comments below. Chitafelings, out.